um, as I was rereading Stroud's um, The Amulet of Samarkand, I realized we probably don't need to spend uh, two or three days on this like I had originally um, assumed. The next book, however, I think will take three days. Um, the Stoneheart book. So we're going to try to go through this one rather quickly. Um, going to try and do it all today, in fact. And I'm going to kind of go through it um, chapter by chapter, but, but not literally, because we're going to skip some chapters. And one thing to bear in mind with this book, unlike some of the others that we've read, um, and, and this is also somewhat the same with Stoneheart, this is the first book of a trilogy. And you kind of, when you get to the end, if you haven't got to it, you'll see. When you get to the end, it, it just kind of ends abruptly. Okay, That's because... When Stroud wrote this, he already knew this is going to lead directly into the second book. Okay? Um, so we, we can't necessarily talk about this as being a self-contained, complete work, because it's not. It, this really can't be read on its own and get everything out of it, because it is part of a much larger whole. Similarly, the second book in the trilogy whose title is escaping me, um, can't be read and understood on its own, okay, without the, um, the first one. So what we, we get with the Amulet of Samarkand is we get Stroud setting up this world, okay, which looks an awful lot like our world with one big difference. Um, Magicians. And as I was rereading this, I hadn't read this for probably, I think it came out in 2004, 2003. I hadn't read this uh, since it came out in 2004. Um, but I wanted to include it because he describes this world so wonderfully. And because there are some ideas or issues or themes that work well in this kind of class. Not just that it's fantasy, okay? It is fantasy, but there are some kind of larger issues involved. The problem is he, he just barely scrapes on the surface of those issues in this book. He starts to really delve into them in books two and book three, and then in the fourth book that he writes, after the trilogy is finished, he goes back and he writes a prequel, okay, um, called The Ring of Solomon. So, it begins, chapter one, with Bartimaeus, okay, and we see Bartimaeus summoned, and we don't know what Bartimaeus is, other than that he's a demon, okay, and we're told not necessarily in this first chapter, but we get told that he doesn't like being called a demon. Okay, What is Bartimaeus literally? A djinn. Right. We kind of use this word in modern English, which is not right, a genie. But it's this. Okay, I think that's plural. He's a djinn. This is an actual Middle Eastern word for a spirit being, okay? And we come to find out that there are multiple levels. There are imps, there are foliots, there are jinn, there are afrids, there are merids, and then there's something even way above those that don't even get named. In fact, when we get to the end of the novel and we see the Ramuthra thing, it's not named other than its actual name, that is, what kind of being it is, we're never told. It's something much, much, much greater than Bartimaeus. You know, kind of like, uh, 
if you think of the Richter scale of seismic activity, you know, you go from 7 to 7.1, we think 0.1 is not that much different. It actually is. Good to go from 7 to 7.1, that 0.1 means it's 10 times stronger than a 7.0. And a 7.2 is 10 times stronger than a 7.1. So it's, it's huge, okay? Once you get beyond the merit and you go up to those unnamed levels, it's like each one is exponentially greater. So we see this summoning and we see this charge given to Bartimaeus. And he's told to go take the amulet of Samarkand from this guy, Simon Lovelace. So the next several chapters, or sub-chapters, I guess, are that. We see Bartimaeus break into Simon Lovelace's house, fight off Jabor and Farquarl, and steal the amulet. And then we get to chapter 5, okay, and we see Nathaniel having a discussion with his master. Okay. How old is he in chapter 5? I don't even think he's 11. Okay. He's younger there. That was like the 6. Yeah, it's, he's very young. And so his master sends him off to his room. And notice how it begins. It begins with... Page 27. Remember this. Demons are very wicked. They will hurt you if they can. Do you understand this? He asks them again. Yes, sir. Well, you say yes, and I'm sure you mean yes, but I don't feel convinced that you understand. So what does he do? What does Arthur Underwood do to five or six-year-old Nathaniel? He sends him off to his office, to his study. The boy goes off. He's told to retrieve a pair of glasses and to put them on. Okay? So he starts to come back, and he makes his way to the door, and things start to move. And he remembers the spectacles. Page 32. He puts them on. And he saw the truth about the study. And what does he see? Without the glasses... The room, you know, looks like this. There's a table or desk. There are bookcases. There's a chair. There are lamps. He puts the glasses on, and what does he see? The room is filled with demons. A hundred small demons filled every inch of the space in front of him. They were stacked one on top of the other, all over the room. In other words, there is not a an inch of space in this room that is not filled with these beings. Like seeds in a melon or nuts in a bag with feet squishing faces and elbows jabbed. So tightly were they clustered, the very carpet was blocked out so that if he walked, it'd be like kicking them all over. And then we get descriptions of these beings. They were every conceivable color, often in inappropriate combinations. They were doing their best to keep very, very still, so as to convince the boy that nobody was there. But the moment he puts on the spectacles, they realize he can see them. So, while he doesn't have these spectacles on, and notice, it's like they're still. Why? What do they not want to do? They don't want to give away their presence. But once they realize he sees them, what do they do? With a cry of glee, they leap at him. For what purpose? Okay, because they can. Don't state the obvious. To terrorize him. Notice, if he can't see them, how can they terrorize him? They can't. Okay? He can't see anything. He wouldn't understand. But once he sees them, once he sees that, is it just the room? 
this specific room that's full of demons? They're everywhere. I think we are meant to see or to understand they're all around. Okay? And he screams and falls back against the door. He raises his hands to protect himself. He rolls onto his face and curls up into a ball. As they do what? They descend on him to tear at him. Okay? What did his master tell him? Demons are very wicked. They will hurt you if they can. Do you understand? He says yes. But Arthur Underwood's not quite sure that he understands. So, what kind of lesson is this? Practical. Louder? Practical. This is a practical lesson. Demons will hurt you. Now, I said, Bartimaeus doesn't like being called a demon. He likes to be called what he is, a djinn. Okay? So why is Arthur Underwood calling them demons? Demon is the human perspective. Okay? Of what? Kind of an uncontrollable spirit. Okay? We go back to Bartimaeus. And he's dealing with the amulet. He gets away, but he kind of gets captured. Or a cost. Okay, put the phones away or leave. Now. Put them away or just leave. Um, and we go back to Nathaniel, chapter 8. Okay. This time, how old is Nathaniel? He's five years old. It's when he first go in, goes into Underwood's service. Okay. So Underwood is there to pick up an apprentice, like he's there to pick up a new printer. He's never had an apprentice before. Okay. So Underwood tells him, page 52, I'm Underwood, your master. Your true life begins now. So what was his previous five years? Nothing. It didn't count. Okay. What is Underwood going to call him for the next seven years? Boy. Boy. Why doesn't he call him by his name? He's supposed to forget it. The boy is supposed to forget his birth name. Because we're told your birth name can give power to people who know it. Specifically, it can give power to demons. If they know your name, it will undercut spells and such. Okay? So, he takes the boy off to his home. Tells his wife, you won't get anything out of him. Meaning, he's not talked at all in the car ride on the ride home. But his wife, Martha, page 53, says, I know we're supposed to forget your name or anything, but it won't really hurt. You can tell me your real name. And he just kind of whispers, Nathaniel. She says, that's a lovely name. So for the next seven years, she calls him by his birth name. He doesn't forget it, obviously. Okay? And it's because she calls him by his birth name that trouble will erupt late, later in the novel. Okay? So, she and her husband talk about the boy in page 54. She's kind of like, I don't understand why we can't call him by his birth name. Okay. And he says, it must be forgotten or future enemies will use it to harm him. How can it be forgotten if his family keeps in contact? She thinks that the boy ought to stay in contact with his real family. And he says, Arthur is saying, no, he needs to be totally separate from them. She says, all the same. It didn't do me any harm. It would be a lot less cruel if magicians were allowed their own children. That is, if magicians could reproduce. So where does everyone 
of these apprentices come from? The ranks of the commoners. They're not coming from magicians. They're being raised by others. It would be a lot less cruel. Okay? Arthur replies, that road leads to competing dynasties, family alliances. This family sets it up itself up against this family. All you have to do is read, you know, the history of families in nations where bloodline is very important. And you see these kinds of dynasties pitted off one against the other. It all ends in blood feuds. Read your history books, Martha. See what happened in Italy. No. Don't worry about the boy. He'll forget soon enough. He'll forget what? He'll forget his family. He'll forget his name. But she keeps using his name. Okay? Right? Go on a few pages. Page 59. Nathaniel is being taught by one of his tutors, his history tutor. Now then, young Underwood, says Mr. Purcell, what is the chief purpose of our noble government? And he looks blank in response. Uh, to rule us? To rule, what does that imply? The government has power, we don't. And Purcell corrects him, to protect us. Why doesn't Nathaniel understand that the purpose of government is to protect? What does it appear, maybe, that government is doing? Protecting or merely ruling? So Purcell kind of goes on and explains this answer. If the empire is to be kept whole, a strong government must be in place. And strong means, in this world, magicians. Imagine the country without them. Cue your stupid little John Lennon song. It would be unthinkable. Commoners would be in charge. We would slip into chaos. Invasion would quickly follow. Why would commoners be in charge? Because magicians have power. Okay? So he says, if we didn't have magicians, the only ones who would be available would be the commoners. All that stands us between us and anarchy is our leaders. And what he really means is all that stands between us and anarchy is magicians. This is what you should aspire to, boy, to be a part of the government. And rule... But I thought the purpose of government wasn't to rule, but was to protect. Notice, even Purcell slips into the mentality that Nathaniel rightly said, to be part of the government and rule honorably. Honor is the most important quality for a magician. Well, we're going to see, as we get into the novel, Bartimaeus doesn't think so. Bartimaeus doesn't think magicians have anything to do with honor. He or she has great power and must use it with discretion. In the past, rogue magicians have attempted to overthrow the state. A little bit of foreshadowing. They have always been defeated. Why? Because true magicians fight with virtue and justice on their side. Truth, honor, and the American way, so to speak. In the course of the novel, do we see, really, any magicians with virtue and justice on their side? We do one. Nathaniel. He's the only one. Now, it might be tainted. It might be a little askew, which we'll talk about later. So, Nathaniel asks him, are you a magician? Here this guy is spouting off about how wonderful magicians are. Nathaniel wants to know, are you, are you one? He says, no. Nathaniel says, oh, so you're a commoner. And he gets back to the lesson at hand. What's Nathaniel's point? He seems to be saying, how can you be talking about how wonderful magicians are when you are not one? 
how do you know that magicians act out of truth and honor and justice when you're not one? What do you really know, in other words, about magicians? Right? So we see more of his exercises and lessons. Chapter 9, we find out about his lessons between the ages of 6 and 8. And we hear at the bottom of 64. He's being taught by his master. A magician is a wielder of power. Tolkien said in the S.M. Fairy Stories, a magician is one who wants to dominate wills and things and produces a rupture in this world. A magician exerts his will and effects change. That is, a magician is someone who does something. A magician isn't a thinker. A magician is a doer. He can do it from selfish reasons, motives, or virtuous ones. The results of his actions can be good or evil. But the only bad magician is an incompetent one. What does Underwood mean? He asks Nathaniel. What is the definition of incompetence? Nathaniel says loss of control. Correct. Providing the magician remains in control of the forces he has set to work, he remains what, boy? And Nathaniel spouts off the answer, safe, secret, strong. But that's not really what Underwood is getting at. Providing, let's go back to that Definition. Providing the magician remains in control of the forces he has set to work, he remains also, go back to the above paragraph, good. Notice, good has nothing to do with morality. And therefore, bad has nothing to do with morality. Good and bad only have to do with performance, ability. You screw up something, that's good or bad. So you can use magic to do what? Kill your enemy. And as long as you're successful, that means you're good. Exactly. So what does it say about the magician's perspective of morality? Think of what was said in the Harry Potter novel by Quirrell towards the end. He said, I learned from my master, there is no good in evil. There is only power. And those too weak to seek it. Okay? Underwood is essentially saying the same thing. With the exception about the comment about power. He would say about power, power is merely how well you are able to control it is what determines good or evil. So, let's jump to the end. Simon Loveless conspires to destroy the government so that he can be the leader of the new government. And he nearly succeeds. He would have succeeded if it hadn't been for Nathaniel. If he had succeeded, according to what Arthur Underwood says here about good and bad, is Simon Lovelace good or bad? Assuming he had succeeded. He would be good. Why? Because he would have demonstrated his control of power. He would have demonstrated his competence. Okay. Even though he would be doing what? He would be what to the government? A traitor. Okay. So he introduces kind of an interesting notion of morality. So they go on talking and they're talking about spirits. And Arthur says, demons, boy, call them what they are, 
One must, what must one never forget? Demons are very wicked and they will hurt you if they can. Do you think he's ever going to forget that lesson? Okay. So demons are the great spirit, the great secret. Common people know of their existence and know that we can commune with them. That's why they fear us. That is, that's why commoners fear us. This is the bottom of page 65. But they do not realize the full truth, which is that all our power derives from demons. That is, wizards, uh, excuse me, magicians can do nothing without demons. Without their aid, we're nothing but cheap conjurers and charlatans. They can call up the demon. But a magician cannot say a spell and make a book move. For example, from this end of the table to that end of the table. What must they do? They must call a demon, whether an imp or a afrit, to make it move from one side to the other. Our single great ability is to summon them and bend them to our will. Notice the importance of will and willpower. If we do it correctly, they must obey us. Meaning, if we are competent, they must obey us. If we're not competent, they will tear us to shreds. All right? So they keep talking. They keep going over Nathaniel's lessons. And we come to chapter 10. Bartimaeus is still making his way back to the house with the amulet of Samarkand. Um, pick up with chapter 11. Nathaniel tells Bartimaeus, where he's going to put the amulet. And Bartimaeus assumes, page 84, that Nathaniel's trying to frame his master. So what does he assume about magicians? Why would he be trying to frame his master? So what, what's he assuming about Nathaniel? If you're framing somebody, what are you doing? Putting them in trouble? Putting them in danger? Putting them in harm's way? Okay. Nathaniel says, I'm not framing him. I just want it safe. So they're going to put it down in um, Underwood's little kind of display cabinet. And we're told the top of page 85. This is Bartimaeus thinking. Magicians hold their knowledge close to their shriveled little hearts, coveting its power the way a miser covets gold. Think Scrooge. And they will only pass it on with caution. Notice what he says about magicians' hearts. They're shriveled and little. Okay? Bottom of the page. Certainly, as he passed underneath me into the bathroom, I'd evidently exited just in time, he fit the bill of second raider. That is, Bartimaeus here is talking about Nathaniel's master. A sure sign of this was that he had all the time-honored attributes that other humans associate with great and powerful magic. A mane of unkempt hair, the color of tobacco ash, long whitish beard that jutted outward like the brow, prow of a ship, and a pair of particularly bristly eyebrows. If you paid any attention to the description of Gandalf in The Hobbit and Dumbledore in Harry Potter, that's the description. Wild, unruly hair, big, long beard, and eyebrows that jut out. It's the same description you will see, you would see later on, of essentially Uncle Andrew in um, The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis, and in lots of other books about magicians or wizards. Okay? What Bartimaeus is saying is, this guy is attempting to fit a stereotype. Right. Skip several more pages. Go on to 98. Hmm. 
Nathaniel is speaking with Ms. Lut Ms. Ms. Lutyens, his drawing teacher. And she makes a negative comment about government, that the government's only good for magicians. And Nathaniel says, you shouldn't say that. Without magicians, the country would be defenseless. Commoners would rule and the country would fall apart. Magicians give their lives to keep the country safe. You should remember that. And she says, I'm sure that when you have grown up, you will make many telling sacrifices, Nathaniel. But in fact, not all countries have magicians. Plenty do very well without them. Okay. What's her point? Magicians aren't needed to protect countries. What else? You only think that way. Why? It's the way he was brought up. Why else? It's what he is. In other words, he's one of the haves. He's one of those in power. All right? She's not. So we get a little bit of the, you know, the envy on the part of the commoners here. Skip a bunch, a whole bunch, I think. Yeah. Um, and go up to very end of chapter 18. Nathaniel's going up to see Parliament. This is after his naming. Um, and he's going up with Underwood and his wife for a party. And the very end of chapter 18, last page. He's sitting in the car, and he's thinking. Sitting by himself in the insulated comfort of the car, a glow of self-satisfaction began to steal over Nathaniel. He was part of things now. Meaning, what? He was an insider on his way to Parliament at last. He was important, set apart from the rest, and it felt good. He thinks that he's kind of on the inside track. Right? You've all been aware of this, whether grade school or middle school or high school. There was always that one group, right? Or a couple of groups that were the in crowd, the in clique. The click with all the power, the click with the prestige and the popularity. And maybe you were in it, or maybe you were outside it, or maybe you were wanting to get in it. This is what Nathaniel is now experiencing. He's been on the outside, and now he feels like he's got a straight shot. For the first time in his life, he knew the lazy exhilaration of easy power. Notice what excites him. Power. The ability to rule others. The ability to control others. The ability to do what one wants. Okay. Skipping a bunch more. Go on to um, page one ninety three. He's listening to the speech the Prime Minister is giving. And he's talking about how well the government is doing in its battles against its enemies. And he says on 193, on the home front, concern has been expressed again about another outbreak of petty pilfering in London. A number of magical artifacts have been reported stolen in the last few weeks alone. Now, we all know these are the actions of a handful of traitors, small-time ne'er-do-wells of no consequence. 
However, if we do not stamp it out, other commoners may follow their lead, like the brainless cattle they are. What's he implying? If we don't stamp, stamp this pilfering out of magical artifacts, other commoners will join in. What will that lead to? He calls them cattle. What does it take to create a stampede? It only takes a few to start the stampede. Okay. So, we will therefore take draconian measures to halt this vandalism. All suspected subver subversives will be detained without trial. I feel sure that with this extra power, internal affairs will soon have the ringleaders safely in custody. So, what's he showing? What's he demonstrating? Control. Power. We're going to stop the, as he calls it, petty pilfering. Okay. He keeps talking. And Nathaniel sees the youth come in and throw the sphere that causes the explosion. Okay. Into the next chapter, uh, pages, pages 203 and 204. They're on their way home, and Nathaniel's talking to his master. And he asks, who are the resistance? Underwood. A bunch of traitors, this middle of 203. A bunch of traitors who don't like us being in control. As if we hadn't given this country all its wealth and greatness. No one knows who they are, but they certainly aren't numerous. A handful of commoners drumming up support in meeting houses. Notice, they certainly aren't numerous. How does he know that? Or does he know that? He doesn't know that. He hopes they're not numerous. A few half-wit firebrands who resent magic and what it does for them. They're not magicians then? Of course not, you fool. That's the point. They're common as muck. They hate us and everything magical and want to bring the government down, as if that were possible. Okay? They want to bring the government down, yet Nathaniel is taught that the government is there to protect them. It's to protect them from their enemies, not commoners. He means external enemies. But the commoners want to bring the government down for what reason? So that they would then be prey to their foreign invaders? So Nathaniel says, okay, then why would they want to steal magical objects? I mean, if they hate magical things. Who knows? Their thinking's all wrong-headed, of course. They're only commoners. Notice, Underwood isn't attempting to try to understand his enemy. Perhaps they hope it'll reduce our power, as if losing a few artifacts would make a blind bit of difference. Would it? What do those magical objects enable the magicians to do? Conjure spirits? Protect themselves? What does the Amulet of Samarkand do? It protects you from anything. Okay? But some devices can be used by non-magicians, as you saw today. So they may be stockpiling weapons for some future assault. It's impossible to tell until we find them and snuff them out. But this was their first actual attack, first on this scale. You say, into that paragraph, you say the assailant was young? Yes, sir. Interesting. Youths have been reported at the scene of the other crimes, too. Still, young or old, these thieves will rule the day, rue the day they're caught. Is it significant that the thieves are young? They're not people in their 20s and 30s. They're teenagers. Okay? That does get significant in books two and three. It's not brought out at all in this book. Okay. Go up to well, never mind, I have no idea why that piece is back. Go to page two seventy.
Nathaniel. has been spying on Underwood, and Underwood catches him. He's looking through his scrying glass, okay, and he sees what Underwood is doing in his office down below, because he's already gotten in trouble, and Underwood sees, essentially, the imp. Okay? And he sees, page 268, Underwood say, traitor. And Nathaniel's like, whoops. Okay. And he sees Underwood say, prepare yourself, I shall come for you. The imp, the imp that is bound to the scrying glass, this seeing glass that enables Nathaniel to spy on people at great distances, says to Nathaniel, top of 270, nasty, ain't it? Being at someone else's mercy. Now you know what it feels like. Face it, kid, you're on your own. You've got no one there to help you. Because he doesn't have Bartimaeus to come protect him. So now he's got to face the wrath of his master on his own. Okay? His master comes up, and what does he assume? Why does he think Nathaniel is spying on him? You turn fair, so. Maybe. Some of the nature of the Okay. Does he think he's doing it on his own? No. No. He thinks somebody else has employed him. Why? What does he think about Nathaniel and his abilities? He's just a child. Thinks he's just a child and he doesn't have any abilities. He doesn't think the kid knows anything. What does Nathaniel... Um... When they first went into his master's office, his study, when they, when they began, when Underwood began his teaching of Nathaniel directly, that is, after the tutors and that kind of stuff, he took him in and he said, you, you can read these books over here. These, you need to know all these by heart. But there is this other bookcase, and he said, and maybe sometime in the far future, you'll be able to... Because the thing I asked, what about this bookcase? And he says, those will be too advanced for you. And yet we're told, by the time Nathaniel was 10 years old, not only had he read all these, he'd read all these. His master had come in and found him one time, reading one of these books, it was written in ancient Coptic. And Nathaniel's eyes were closed, and his master thought he'd fallen asleep reading it. But he wasn't asleep. What was he doing? He was memorizing because that's how he memorized. He would read, then close his eyes, and go back over it. Okay? And Bartimaeus shows up just in time. Okay? And Loveless shows up at the same time. Okay? Why is Loveless there? Because they've traced the amulet there, and because they followed Bartimaeus. So all hell breaks loose in chapter 29. Page 289. We're told Nathaniel could not run. He could not hide. That was the advice of a demon. Bartimaeus said run, hide. But running and hiding were not the actions of an honorable magician. They are of every other magician in the book. If he let his master face Loveless alone, how would he live with himself again? When his master suffered, Mrs. Underwood would suffer too, and that would be impossible. No, there was no help for it. Nathaniel found to his surprise and horror he had to act. Regardless of the consequences, he had to intervene. So, Loveless wants to know how Underwood got the amulet. 291. Nathaniel says, I took it person you want is me. Underwood can't believe this, obviously. Okay? But once he accepts that Nathaniel did, did it, he says, all I can do is apologize for him. Page 294. Underwood's trying to speak and Loveless cuts him off. He says, quiet, man. I want to hear the boy's reasons. Nathaniel, it wasn't his fault. That is, 
Loveless wants to know, why are you telling me this? Why are you standing up for your master? Because it wasn't his fault. He knew nothing. Your quarrel was with me, whether you knew so or not. He should be left out of it. That's why I came down. What's Nathaniel doing? Again, something we don't see other magicians do within the course of the novel. Who stole the amulet? Nathaniel did. Why did he steal it? Get back at Loveless for what? Humiliating. Because he humiliated him two years earlier. Okay. Nathaniel had that little duel of wits with him, and he was able to answer all of Loveless's questions immediately. And Loveless kind of verbally spanked him, let's say. Nathaniel goes on up to his room, and he tries to send those mites down onto Loveless. And so Loveless kind of hangs him upside down in the air and spanks him, literally, with an imp. Okay? And that just really burns. So he steals the amulet to get back at him. Does he know that the amulet is extremely important? No, he doesn't. Right? Though he finds out from Bartimaeus that somebody was killed for that amulet. So, what's he doing? He's taking responsibility for his actions. A sense of the utter futility of his action weighed down upon him. Of his action of stealing the amulet? No. The futility in taking responsibility, Loveless chuckles. Some childish notion of nobility, is it? What does Loveless think of nobility? Purcell tried to teach Nathaniel that magicians are honorable. They're noble. What's Loveless saying? Nonsense. I guessed as much. The honorable course of action, heroic but stupid, where did you get that notion from? Not from Underwood here. I'll bet. Nathaniel, I robbed you because you wronged me. In other words, pure vengeance. I wanted to get back at you. That's all there is to it. Punish me if you want. I don't care. What's he saying? Leave them out of it. They are innocent. Okay. So Underwood finally speaks. You must deal with him as you wish. Whatever sentence fits the crime, you may administer it. I leave it entirely up to you. What does that mean? You can kill him if you want. Okay. Nathaniel stands up to defend Underwood. And Underwood feeds him to the dogs, or to the lions. Okay. But Loveless says, I will after I dispose of you. <laughs> you know, Underwood's like, what? Why? Why me? Well, maybe you don't know what this object is, but I can't take that chance, which Underwood has already recognized what it is. Page 295. Okay. Underwood begs for mercy. Loveless, such loyalty from a master to his apprentice. Very touching. You see, John, Underwood and I are giving you a final lesson in the art of being a magician. And perhaps with our help you will understand your error in owning up to me today. You believed in the notion of the honorable magician, who takes responsibility for his actions. Mere propaganda. In other words, those are lies we spread to get people to believe in us. Such a thing does not exist. There is no honor, no nobility, no justice. Every magician acts only for himself. I mean, this is, there is no good and evil, there is only power. And in this context, and those who seek it. When he's weak, he avoids danger, that is, the magician. Which is why second raiders plod away within the system. Arthur knows all about that, don't you, Underwood? 
But when he is strong, he strikes. When a magician is strong, he takes power. He takes what he wants. How do you think Rupert Devereaux himself came to power? His master killed the previous prime minister in a coup 20 years ago, and he inherited the title. Notice that. It's not Devereaux who killed the previous prime minister. His master killed the previous prime minister, and Devereaux became prime minister. Devereaux is merely the apprentice to his master, or was. That's the truth of it. That is how things are always done. Nathaniel cries, please. Is he thinking of his master? No. He's thinking of Mrs. Underwood, who has always been kind to him. You are weak, boy, just like your master. He claps his hands, and all hell starts to break loose. Okay. Bartimaeus gets him out safely. Part 3. Okay. Page 313. They're hiding in the warehouse, and Bartimaeus tells him, I hate to say this, but Loveless was right. You were totally out of your depth last night. Magicians don't act the way you do. It was a good thing I was there to rescue you. So, what are you going to do now? Prog? What does he mean? Magicians don't act the way you do. Yeah. Honorably. Where does Nathaniel get this notion of honor? Was it taught to him by his tutors? No, it's internal. Page 314. They keep talking, and Bartimaeus is kind of teasing him, poking him in the ribs, as it were. And we're told the Jenny's uh, jibes had cut through his weariness and grief to ignite a pent-up fury that suddenly consumed him. It rose up from his guilt, his shock, and his mortal anguish, and used them for its fuel. Loveless had said that there was no such thing as honor, that every magician acted only for himself. Very well. Nathaniel would take him at his word. He would not make such a mistake again. Meaning what? He's going to follow Lovelace's example? He's not going to act honorably? Or he's going to assume that all other wizards are not going to act honorably? Skip a few more pages. Go to 318. He's thinking of going after Loveless. And he tells Bartimaeus, I owe it to my master. He was a good man. No, he wasn't. That's not the reason at all. It isn't justice or honor that drives you now, boy. And notice he's speaking in his ear. It's like those old cartoons where you have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. You can't take the consequences of your actions. Excuse me. It isn't justice or honor that drives you now, boy, but guilt. You can't take the consequences of your actions. What are the consequences of his actions? Mrs. Underwood is dead. Burned alive. You seek to drown out what you've done to your master and his wife. Well, if that's the way you humans choose to suffer, so be it. But leave me out of the equation. So Nathaniel says, I'll make a bargain with you. Help me avenge myself on Loveless, and I'll set you free immediately afterward. Then there can be no doubt about our positions. It's in both our interests to succeed. Because what power all throughout the novel does Nathaniel have over Bartimaeus? What does he do? Before he sends him out to retrieve the amulet. He takes that metal tin 
that tobacco tin, and he fills it with what? Lavender? Lavender or something like that. Rosemary. Rosemary. And he puts a charm on it that at the end of the month, Bartimaeus will be confined to that tin. He takes the tin, he takes a brick, he puts them in a bag, he walks to the middle of Blackfriars Bridge or something like that, and drops it into the middle of the Thames. And if at the end of a month he doesn't release Bartimaeus from that spell, Bartimaeus will be confined to that tin until somebody finds it and releases him. And Rosemary is, let's say, detrimental to a Jenny's uh, essence. So when he says, I'll make the bargain with you, you help me get my vengeance on Loveless, and I'll release you, he means, not only will I release you from my power, I'll release you from that, the threat of that tin. Okay? Page 326. They're talking about Loveless. And... Bartimaeus says, whatever the amulet's exact capacity, it's clear Loveless is going to use it in the next few days at that conference he's arranged. How? Who knows? Why? Well, that's easy. He's seizing power. That old story. He's a renegade, a traitor. He's a normal magician. You're just the same. How dare you? Well, not yet. Maybe give it a few years. What does Bartimaeus mean? Okay, keep going. What is every magician after? Power. Nathaniel's had a taste of power. What has that taste been like? Turkish delight for Edmund. Once he tastes the witch's Turkish delight, what's he want? More. And then more. And then more. Power has been called the greatest narcotic. Because once you've had a hit of power and what does it take to get the same thrill and rush? More and more and more and more. You never are satisfied with what you have. Okay? Go on to page 354. Um, they're making their way off to... Hedleham Hall. And they come to the commoner village out in the country. And Nathaniel says, don't they realize how vulnerable they are? They've got no defenses. He doesn't see any imps, any magical defenses. Any magical attack and they'd be helpless. Bartimaeus. Perhaps that's not high on their list of priorities. There are other things to worry about. Making a living, for example. In other words, getting by. Not that you'll have been taught anything about that. And then notice the footnote. I hope you didn't skip the footnotes, because the footnotes are where an awful lot of the humor is. They get even funnier in the next two second and third books. How true this was. Magicians are essentially parasitic. In societies where they are dominant, they live well off the strivings of others. In those times and places when they lose power and have to earn their own bread, they are generally reduced to a sorry state, performing small conjurations for jeering alehouse crowds in return for a few brass coins. In other words, they don't work hard. They don't produce anything. Okay? Nathaniel, oh no. To be a magician is the greatest calling. Our skills and sacrifices hold the country together, and those fools should be grateful we're there. Really? Their skills and sacrifices hold the country together? Who is it that produces the food that Nathaniel eats? Commoners. Okay.
We keep going on. Page 380. Nathaniel's now in the hall. And we're told about two-thirds down of the page. On 380. Whatever happened, there would be no more helpless standing by while his enemies acted with impunity. He was taking control of events now. He was doing the hunting. He was closing in. Right? This is Nathaniel making his way. He's, he doesn't have a plan formulated because he doesn't know what Loveless is actually up to. Okay? He sees the page boy, okay? knocks him out, takes his clothes, goes on along, sees Loveless, follows Loveless, chapter 38, and is surprised by Loveless. 390, 391 following. In 394, Loveless leaves Nathaniel alone in the library with his, Loveless's, master. Notice it's kind of the master calling the shot, so to speak. 394. Actually, 393. Skyler offers him what? Bottom of the page. Well now, you are young, Mandrake, but we recognize your ability. You have the makings of a great magician. Join with us, he says, and we shall provide you with the apprenticeship you have always craved. Think about it. No more experiments in solitude. No more bowing or scraping to fools. We will test and inspire you. We will draw out your talent let it breathe. And one day, when Simon and I are gone, you will be supreme. And we're told Nathaniel's thinking about this. Six years of frustrated ambition were etched into his mind. Six years of suppressed desire to be recognized for what he was, to exercise his power openly, to go to Parliament as a great minister of state. And now his enemies were offering it all to him. Ah, oh, you're tempted. Well, what do you say? Does Simon Lovelace really think I will join him? He does. After everything that's happened, even so, he knows how your mind works. Why does Lovelace know how Nathaniel's mind works? What does Lovelace see when he sees Nathaniel? He sees himself at 12 years old. He thinks Nathaniel will take the offer because he would have. Then Simon Lovelace is a fool. John, an arrogant fool. You must, you must what? You must see our position. You must see the rightness of our offer. Schuyler never gets to finish the sentence. After what he has done to me, he could offer up the world and I'd refuse it. Join him? I would rather die. What can Lovelace offer Nathaniel? No, that's not true. Power. What else? Prestige. Authority. What else? Training. He can train Nathaniel to become the most powerful magician alive. Okay, Loveless isn't a slouch, obviously. But Skyler says, you know, I thought that's what you would say. So Nathaniel kills him. Pushes the bookcase over, breaks his, causes him to break his neck and stuff. All right, go on to, um, we're going to skip a bunch. Go on to 434. They're now in the conference room. Doors are sealed. The metal rods have come down around the window so they can't escape. And Loveless has 
summon the spirit. Okay. And he starts to talk to John. This is before everything starts to go completely crazy. 434, he says, you know, John, if you'd had the luck to be apprenticed to me from the start, we might have done great things together. I recognize something in you. This is what I was talking about. It's like looking into a mirror of my younger days. We share the same will to power. And what does Loveless mean by that? Did I sign the Nietzsche readings in here? I don't think I did. He means what Friedrich Nietzsche talks about in his book, The Will to Power. That there are people who are born into the world who are not constrained by everyday ordinary laws or morality. Nietzsche calls them the supermen. He doesn't mean superman. He means people who are above everybody else because of their greatness, because of their inherent abilities. They shouldn't be bound by common standards of morality. They should be allowed to do what they think is best. If it means having to kill a few people to achieve their ends, then by all means let them kill a few people to achieve their ends. Okay? Hitler thought he was one of these people. Stalin thought he was one of these people. Marx, uh, excuse me, not Marx, um, Lenin thought he was one of these people. That to achieve their goals, okay, a lot of people have to die. Sorry about that, but that's the way it is. So, he smiles, but you are corrupted by Underwood's softness. In other words, if you had been apprenticed by me, he would have done what to this will to power? Like a flame? Yeah, he would have encouraged it. He would have fanned that flame. Okay? But if he had done so, what is likely John would have done? Or Nathaniel would have done? Killed him. Okay? Even now, as he sees Nathaniel's trying to find a way to stop him. Even now you haven't given up. And that's what I'm, exactly what I'm talking about. It's your iron will in action. He's assuming Nathaniel should do what? What have the other ministers started to do? Flee. They're trying to run away and protect themselves. It's very good, but if you'd been my apprentice, I'd have trained you to keep it in check. That is, to keep that iron will in check until you had the ability to follow through. If he is to survive, a true patient, magician must be patient. Okay? So we see the battle kind of going on. And Lovelace is talking about what the amulet does and what Ramuthra does. Okay? Page 445. They've tricked Ramuthra. Bartimaeus takes on the form of Loveless's girlfriend. Okay. Tricks Loveless. And so Ramuthra has essentially consumed Loveless. And now they're left with the problem of getting Ramuthra back where he belongs. The other place. Um, Stroud never describes that. Take it back. He does describe it. He never defines it. He never defines what the other world is. The world where the jinni, the demons, come from. It is a world of chaos. We do know that. Okay? And he says, we've got to come up with the incantation. Nathaniel, I know it. Are you sure? He scowled at me. Physically, he was pretty ropey. White of skin, bruised, bleeding, swaying where he stood. That possibility hadn't occurred to you, had it? Yes, I've learned it. There's more than a hint of doubt in his voice. It's high level. No time for false pride, boy. And notice, Nathaniel does know the incantation. Page 446. He knew the incantation. He had learned it long ago. That is, he hadn't been kind of prepping for this instance. He would speak it, and everyone would see that he could not be overlooked again. Always, always, he had been underestimated. Meaning, nobody thinks he can do what he can do. Underwood had thought him an imbecile. 
A fool with barely the strength to draw a circle. He had refused to believe his apprentice could summon a genie of any kind. Loveless had thought him weak, childishly soft-hearted, yet likely to be tempted by the first cursory offer of power and status. He had refused to accept that Nathaniel had killed Skylar too. He had gone to his death denying it, and now even Bartimaeus, his own servant, doubted he knew the dismissal spell. Always, always they cast him down. So what is it Nathaniel is really seeking? Is it power? No, it's like Harry when he puts on the sorcerer's, uh, excuse me, the sorting hat. He has a desire to prove himself. The outcry of his wounded pride almost overwhelmed him. Bottom of 446 still. But at the deeper core of his being, beneath his desperation to succeed for his own sake, another desire struggled for expression. Far off, he heard someone cry out in fear, and a shudder of pity ran through him. Okay. A shudder of pity. What is pity? Louder? Feeling bad. For himself? Unless he could bring the spell to mind, the hapless magicians were going to die. Their lives depended on him, and he had the knowledge to help. Notice, beyond his desperation to succeed for his own sake, another desire struggles for expression. That is something deeper than his desire to prove himself. Struggles to have a voice. What's that deeper desire? It's the same thing we see in the character of Harry Potter. It's this desire to help others. Okay? Which, notice, is entirely the opposite of self-will. It's entirely the opposite of the desire of the Superman. The Nietzschean will to power. Their lives depended on him, and he had the knowledge to help. The counter summons, the dismissal, and he starts thinking about it. He'd remembered it. He'd memorized it. All right? Page 449. 448, real briefly. He does the spell. He banishes Ramuthra. And then he does what? He takes the amulet of Samarkand out, off from around his neck. He walks over to where Rupert Devereaux is cringing in fear. And hands it to him. What is the amulet of Samarkand? It's, it's his all-state policy. It's his, you're in good hands. What do I mean by that? It's his what? It's his protection. He keeps that amulet. And what could Rupert Devereaux do to him? Nothing. What could all those ministers together do to him? Nothing. He keeps the amulet, and he becomes invincible. He doesn't become the most powerful, but he becomes unconquerable. Because whatever spell they throw at him, whatever genie, whatever effort, whatever, whatever spirit they summon, can't touch him. Unless the spirit they summon is more powerful than the spirit encased in the amulet. Okay? 449. Typical of the kid that was. What is Bartimaeus saying? Okay. This is Bartimaeus reading Nathaniel's character. Having carried out the most important act of his grubby little life, you'd expect him to sink to the ground in exhaustion and relief. But did he? No. This was his big chance, and he seized it in the most theatrical fashion possible. With all eyes on him, he hobbled across the ruined auditorium like a wounded bird, frail as you like, straight to the center of power. What was he going to do? No one knew. No one dared to guess. I saw the Prime Minister flinch when the boy held his hand out. And then the climactic moment of this little charade all was revealed. The legendary amulet of Samarkand held up high so all could see. Okay. He wants everybody to realize what he's doing. 
he handed it back to the bosom of the government and bows his head. Why does he bow his head? Because this is the prime minister. This is the authority, the seat of government, so to speak. What does he mean, so typical of the kid? What's Nathaniel doing here? We hear throughout the novel, he wants power, he seeks power, he desires power. And yet, he doesn't take it. He gives it away. Now, what happens as a result? He gets placed as the apprentice of a really he powerful... He gets placed as the apprentice of Jessica Whitwell, who's really high up there. Okay? And she tells him. Actually, Bartimaeus tells him. This is when he's getting ready to release Bartimaeus. Page 461. For a magician, you've got potential. And I don't mean the way you think I mean. In other words, you think I mean you could become the greatest, most powerful magician there is. For a start, you've got far more initiative than most of them, but they'll crush it out of you if you're not careful. What does he mean by initiative? You do things on your own. And you've a conscience, too. That's another thing, rare and easily lost. Guard it. Oh, and beware of your new master. So what does he mean? You've got potential. He says, I don't mean by what you think I mean. So what does he mean? It's the conscience part of it. Yeah, it's that conscience part of it. You've got the potential what? To care. To care. To do really great things, but not great in the sense that a regular magician would think. Because a regular magician would think of greatness as what? Seizing power. Gaining more power. So maybe Bartimaeus means something like the opposite. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Um, start Stoneheart. If you haven't already, for Thursday.